I'm always very nervous following Greg because I get carried away by Greg's ideas and Greg's leadership, um, a word that Greg used a lot through the presentation. And, um, and Greg has exhorted us to think about leadership in the sustainability space um, in a way that does take a bit of time to reflect upon. So I feel very uncomfortable standing up straight away to respond to Greg, because I think what you've said to us tonight, Greg, requires some deep thought and some analysis and some quiet reflection rather than throwing something straight back out at an, at an audience. Um, but I'm going to try, and I, I know you well enough to know that if I get some of it wrong, we can have a, a talk over a drink afterwards. Um, I think it's really interesting that some of the words that you used um, are the words that we tend to typically think about, um, about sustainability and the long term. So leadership and transformation, they're, they're words that we hear all the time, particularly in a business context, about the need to transform, um, the need to create great leaders, to support our leaders to lead. Um, and you talked very um, succinctly and, and appropriately about this link that leaders make between government, business, civil society, um, and how we operate as actors, as leaders, um, particularly in business, across those domains. Um, and I love the way you talk about what it was that BP was doing and that you do personally all the time, which is the scanning of the horizon and the looking for discontinuities. Because I actually don't think that happens at all in business anymore. I think there are some global businesses that do that, but it's not, I don't think in the business discourse we currently are subjected to, I can't recall hearing a business in the public domain talking about their active scanning of the horizon, other than in the next 12 months or perhaps two years. But I haven't heard someone talking about scanning the environment for the next 50 years, other than in a doomsday scenario or to knock down climate scientists and say they look too long term. And we hear at the, in the current political discourse what we're hearing are businesses saying the next 12 months matters and external factors are driving our... The current political external factors are driving our results. Often that's, that's a lie being perpetrated on the public, I believe, um, because often it's not external factors, it's, it's the ability of leaders and organisations to, to thrive in tough times. And if you're failing, it's not so much the external environment, it's the inability to be a leader and to be transforming and to be scanning that horizon. Um, I love the way you spoke about trends and megatrends and metatrends, um, and I particularly like the fact that you used the phrase human agency. Because what, what I'd like to do in reflecting on my own experiences is to really hone in on the, no the notion of human agency um, and link that to your view about um, leadership and what leadership looks like in, in the corporate environment and, and what are we all working towards? What's, what's this all about in a business sense? Um, so I wanted my response to start, I guess, with the current electoral cycle that we're in and the complete degradation of the, um, of the discussion of the long term. Um, I think yesterday was the first time the potential Prime Minister used the term good society. And it was used in relation to his desire to work in Indigenous communities, which is very admirable and is something that every leader, um, whether business or political or social, should be spending time in, in Australia. But he used it to say, I think that makes us a good society. But there's been no discussion by either side of politics or the major, the major drivers of politics in this country of what a good society looks like in the context of our environment, our social structures. We're hearing about a good society, in his case, in terms of um, engagement with Aboriginal people, but against a backdrop of fear of, um, of asylum seekers seeking refuge, of an economy that could fail, um, and of um, party structures, political party structures um, that, that are collapsing around us. So um, I don't think we're hearing anything like we should about a good society. And as a result, that's falling to business to, to try to define. Um, and then we received the document of the BCA in the lead up to the announcement of the election. And it was a fine document. It was OK. But when I think about your scanning of the future, it didn't meet the test for me of the role of the business playing its agency role and its leaders playing a role that was seriously looking at the trends and, and issues that will affect this country and should be debated by our, our political leaders. It talked about tax reform, it talked about workplace reform. The reforms are things you can put in a standard document, I think, um, that, that, um, that wouldn't take a lot of leadership. I know the Business Council tried hard, I know Jennifer Westacott tried very hard, and her constituency was genuine in its attempt to try to frame the future. I don't fault the, um, the intent, but the capacity, the human agency sitting underneath the Business Council to your point, Greg, and I think it's one of the strongest points of, of business hiding behind their, 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 um, their um, associations. associations, thank you. And, and what happens is you get a lowest common denominator because the whole of, the, of the, um, the, those that are members of the association have to agree with the statements being made out into the public. So you don't get your, um, your very significant leaders standing up and actually calling 
governments to account on the very, very long term. So I think the BCA did the best it could. Um, it was a decent document, but it didn't do what you've, you've said business, I think, should do when it's acting its best. So in the limits, given the limits of time I've got, and I want to hear what Matt has to say as well, um, I think what I'd like to say is that for all that Greg has put to us, the human agency piece of this is critical. And I think that what you've put to us about the quality and character of leaders in business requires the, the courage you spoke about and the need to speak out. And I put that in the context of being, um, I'm going to give it a gender context for a start and then a diversity context. Because I spend a lot of time nowadays on boards where I'm either the only woman or um, the only person who's not the member of the club or come from the outside and brought in to help bring diversity um, to a discussion. And I think that <coughs> deferral of the courage to the new person arriving, whether it's the first woman or the first Indigenous person or the first, person, first Muslim person, or whoever the, the different person is arriving, actually brings with them a difficult task, which is actually to provoke a change in the norm of the club's behaviour. And in a leadership context, that means our boards need lots more new people arriving to actually make that provocation and allow the rest of the group to relax and actually debate amongst themselves, where previously that has been seen to be breaking the group's norms. So I wanted to say, Greg, that I think we've got to get into a big conversation, big research projects about not just about where are our leaders and, and what they should be doing against your list of uh, criteria, but how do you build courageous leaders? Where do those leaders come from and, and where do they start out? And where are the boards around them? So you mentioned chairmen or chairwomen or chairpeople. I'd ask about the character of a board and the character of people in the governance sense who actually can help steer the organisation to be a better leading organisation than just just relying on what has always been the case, which has been those who have struggled with their own worlds and been reflected by people who are very much like them um, on those boards or in those executive teams. Um, so I would then ask the question, who gets to lead? Who gets to go into boardrooms? Who gets to actually get to the chief executive's office? And I think that's a, there's a research question in all of this about the capability and competencies of people we think should be leading anything. And we look at, we're having a current discussion, I think, at a political level that our political leaders are not leaders. They're managers, and we're not seeing anything that looks like leadership in terms of the, the, the reaching to society and helping to lift our sights and help us as a, as a country scan the future. We're not getting that at all. And I think people, are, particularly in Australia, but elsewhere, are desperate for authenticity and for people who do stand up and say, I think what we're doing is crazy, or I think this, this constant issue around the economy is not actually being used to talk about the environmental aspects of the economy, the social aspects of the economy. Um, those issues of sustainability get lost. Um, and so I think we've got a lot of research to do, a lot of development to do on the actual, the basis, the basic underpinning of what makes a courageous leader. How, what are the component pieces of that? Um, how do they learn to operate in complex dynamic situations, handle complexity, reveal their own insecurities to, to those that they're helping to lead? Um, and not feel frightened by that, so that others understand that we're all in this together. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that sustainability has a lot to answer for, the sustainability movement, because in the midst of all your presentation, um, uh, Greg, there has been the growth of the sustainability professional. And um, I tweet a lot. I enjoy Twitter. Um, I think there are a number of tweeters in the room. And I'm always <laughs> amazed when I tweet a sustainability story, or what's got a sustainability in the title, the only people who retweet that are sustainability professionals. If I tweet a similar story with no sustainability in it, business people retweet my tweet. But they won't retweet, a business person will not retweet my tweets that have sustainability in the title. Because the business people on Twitter are using that social media for a different purpose. But they like to get new information about big risks, threats, and so things to do with climate change, social issues, so long as it doesn't have sustainability in it and is framed as a business risk, they retweet. And they're quite interested in it. So this notion of how we actually um, we set ourselves up to discuss what is a sustainable development issue, must move and be guided by sustainability professionals into the mainstream of the business um, and, and of the leaders' capacities to actually act and, and, and become those human agents that we need. What I want to leave you with is the fact that we know what, we can, we know what we've got to do. There is no shortage of information that's current and that sits on, um, on shelves around the country ready for us to scan the long term for our country. Every year there's the State of Australian Cities, which is a wealth of information for business about what goes on in the cities where businesses need to thrive. I bet not many businesses actually read the State of Australian Cities report and actually look, dive into that and think about their business strategies around the State of Australian Cities. 
Department of Industry, Innovation and Climate Change produced the Climate Adaptation Outlook, um, which tells you all you need to know, really, about the big issues in Australia about adapting to climate change. This is not a science document. This is a document about how we're going to adapt at a social, economic, city, country, regional level. And I bet almost no one's read the Climate Adaptation Report, either physically or online. The um, Australian Bureau of Statistics produces measures of Australia's progress. Aspirations for our nation are conversations with Australians about progress. You might not even know this exists. I'm sure many businesses don't know that the Bureau of Stats is now producing conversation documents where they're looking at trends that are coming from surveys they're doing with the ordinary public about what the ABS should be looking at and reflecting into our communities. And lastly, um, I've been serving on the National Sustainability Council for the last uh, year, and we produced the Sustainable Australia report this year, also called Conversations with the Future. Now, there's not sustainability language in here. This is simply the story of the opportunities for Australians to think long-term and for businesses, not-for-profits, educators, whomever, to think about the future. And we have promoted this. We have launched it. We've done everything we can to get Australians, businesses or otherwise, academics, interested in what lies in here, which is all rigorous data about the future of the country looking out 50 years. I don't think... Has anyone read this document in this room? There's a few. Seen it, yeah. So I, I go back to the human agency. Our human um, agents, our leaders, have got to have the capacity as they're scanning to look at what we've already know, grab hold of it, uh, tackle it, integrate it, um, and that's a skill. That's a skill, and often it requires someone coming in and assisting those leaders by bringing that new information in a way that's thoughtful, not provocative, generous, not to try to cut down the tall poppy, and encourage the proper conversations we're going to need about the very big issues that um, that Greg so rightly raised with us tonight. Thanks.